Hi, everyone, and good afternoon. Thank you for joining the Economic Club of Indiana. We're delighted you're here. The Economic Club is a 40-year-old Indiana-based organization that invites extraordinary national and local leaders to, to share information that is relevant and timely for all of us. My name is Kathy Langham. I am CEO and President of Langham Logistics. And I'm also honored this year to be president of the Economic Club of Indiana. Before introducing today's guest, I'd like to also take a minute and thank our platinum sponsors. Uh, you guys have been there supporting us virtually through the last year, and we really appreciate your help. As we continue to remain vigilant about safety protocols, we at the Economic Club are beginning to emerge a bit from behind our desks. So I'm pleased to be sitting here live and in person with today's guests in the State House right after the session has ended. We don't have, we don't plan on having an in-person uh, meeting this year. We only have one more meeting after this, that's in May, but beginning next year, we're hoping we'll all be back together. So hang in there. Uh, the su success of these virtual events in a large part is due to social media. So we are keeping the conversation going through social media at Economic Club IN. So please help us with that. I'm very pleased to introduce this month's speaker, Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb. A lifelong Hoosier, Governor Holcomb was elected as the 51st governor of the state of Indiana in 2016. He's a veteran of the US Navy. He was a trusted advisor to both Governor uh, Mitch Daniels and Senator Dan Coats, and also was former uh, state chairman of the Republican Party. He led the way for the largest long-term infrastructure investment in our state's history with the 20-year Next Level Roads Program, which will invest $4.7 billion in roads and bridges within the next five years. As a trucker, I really appreciate that. <laughs> he created the Next Level's Jobs Program to help get more Hoosiers into high-demand, high-wage jobs. In his first legislative session as governor, he rallied bipartisan support to expand pre-K for low-income Hoosier kids and unveiled Next Level Recovery, a one-stop shop for information and resources to help the opioid crisis. He has a mission to make mm -hmm. Indiana competitive in the global economy by bringing the world to Indiana and taking Indiana to the world. So our governor has visited and met with leaders in Japan, uh, Hungary, France, the UK, and other places uh, to, to help us grow. Ladies and gentlemen, the 51st governor of the United States of Indiana, Eric Holcomb. Kathy, thank you. It's good yeah. to be with you in the audience. I've been really looking forward to this hour. <laughs> yeah, welcome, welcome. We're, we, we have two, well. thank you. Congrats on the success of March Madness uh, and the Final Four. And uh, last month, we had the chance to talk to Mark Emmert. Yes. And he uh, really uh, said that you did an amazing job as, as well as the mayor and uh, Visit Indy and Sports Corp and bringing this thing to town so quickly and creating this. So how did it happen? <laughs> well, you know, I've done a, a few other interviews and I've, I've repeated the only in Indiana and whether you're from Indiana or outside of Indiana, there's a kind of an acknowledgement yeah. of that fact that it didn't happen just this year. It happened because there was a lot of trust and a lot of confidence. This is what we do. Yeah. We come together as a team. Yeah. You just listed the list. I salute um, Mark Emmert and his whole crew from the CMO, from the chief medical officer to the folks doing the laundry, all those volunteers that stepped up and said, we can, we can do this. And for uh, Mark Emmert to say first, could we do it? Should we do it? And then to have the courage to acknowledge, yes, we can. Yes, we should. It's so, it was good for the, our, all of our health, not just the players, but fans too. And the, 
the hope and joy that I saw on people's faces. So it really was a team um, effort and they left nothing to chance. Everything that they could control, they did. The discipline that was exhibited was flawless and so many good memories were made, whether you were at the game or not. I mean, I had a lot of good memories myself and yeah. got to plead with Sister Jean if she would recommend next year we do this all here again in Indiana. And I, I gave her a Robert Indiana, you know, the love sculpture and said, we loved having you and we'd love to have you back. Think of Indiana as your second home. And oh, by the way, would you recommend we do this here perpetually? So a lot of good memories. And then who, who could think about this only in Indiana, everyone coming together on final four that Saturday, I attended a high school basketball um, championship game. Um, and then Got some dinner, went to the Final Four, uh, and was literally in Lucas Oil watching Gonzaga UCLA and watching my phone watch Carmel play Lawrence North. Both games go into overtime. Thrilling, exciting games. Come down to the wire and then get in the car and drive home, and the Pacers beat the Spurs in overtime. And so, you <laughs> know, just night. an overload of, <laughs> of joy. So, uh, but it was people at the end of the day, it was, we all came together. We looked at the data. We let that drive our decisions and we always put safety first. Oh, very good. Well, and we, the economic club also asked him if he'd do it again here. So maybe we put enough bugs in his ear that he exactly. could consider that. Uh, was there anything we could have done differently or better? Well, I guess hindsight's 2020, although I want to, I want 2020 to be hindsight, to be quite yeah. honest. Uh, you know, you along the way, maybe you could have enticed others to be more uh, part of it and, mm -hmm. and benefit. But really looking back on it, as well as the whole of 2020, I mean, this was novel by definition, what, what we faced is still. And so we're learning along the way. And I think we just have to you know, adjust and adapt and we can overcome. We just have to do things differently. Clearly we proved that we could. And that was a huge statement to the world that here in Indiana, here in our capital city, we could pull off a big event that quite frankly is gonna to lead to the next big event. And that's the month of May, ending with the greatest spectacle in racing on yes. May 30th. Yes, very exciting. Well, it looked flawless. I mean, yeah. the event looked flawless, so it was yeah. great. Kudos to all. Uh, let's talk vaccines for a couple of minutes. Sure. So Notre Dame and Rutgers have all, yeah. all both announced that their students will have to be vaccinated to come back to school in the fall. Mm -hmm. So how are you thinking about the state employees coming back to work? And I know you <laughs> want to open Indiana, but yep, what does all yep. that look like? Yeah, well, kudos to to uh, Notre Dame and Rutgers and Purdue and IU and on and on and on. I mean, when you think about, leave it to the engineers at Purdue, they're doing some 40 plus doses every 10 minutes um, down to the minute. You know, Notre Dame, their student body was plus 90% already got their first dose the last time I checked. Um, IU is, you know, they have a vaccination clinic in assembly hall. Um, and so we're all, and, and our other colleges and universities are doing uh, the same, really stepping up, making sure that we can get back. Mm -hmm. And before you leave, quite frankly, in their, from their perspective, the students leave for summer. The state of Indiana is in the process of bringing everyone back. I have a, and it's been in the works, but in a word, it's very, it's methodical mm -hmm. and it's safe, of course, that should go without being said. Um, but we're, we're looking at, you know, our senior teams are all back. Um, their staffs are forming up. And we're looking at by Independence Day to be full force here in the state of Indiana. Mm -hmm. Having said that, we've recognized, just like the private sector has recognized, um, how to become more efficient. And there will be some jobs that are remote by definition. And so, you know, we'll, we're, we have a lot of trust. We have a great administration that's looking at their real estate, their personnel, where pieces mm -hmm. need to be in order to be most efficient. Um, but but come this summer, as we come back from that July 4th holiday, you know, I've been this administration is we, we never left. We've been here every single day. And all we've added is safety precautions, including, you know, 1.7 million Hoosiers um, fully vaccinated. Yeah. And um, and um, that goes a long, long way. So every time Subaru or Sweetwater or you name it around the state of Indiana, corporations. 
um, are, are making sure that their employees have access to that vaccination, convenient access, that just gets us mm -hmm. all back because mm -hmm. we're all in this together, right. more than rhetorically speaking. Right. Yeah, it feels like things are getting better, starting yeah. to open yeah. up. And, and it sounds like you, you are thinking through the same things. Even the small businesses are thinking about how to bring people back if to bring them back, uh, all that sort yeah, of thing. We're, we're running this like a business. And we're, you know, our revenues prove that. And that only helps us serve more people. And so as long as our economy is humming, which it is, um, it's robust, then, then we, can, we can do even more to help people as they recover from the pandemic, whether it has to do with, you know, our suicide rates or our addiction rates, all those things that we're also watching beyond those economic indicators. Right. So we've seen you at the track lately. Um, we saw you get your vaccine there. That was fantastic. And no, you're a huge race fan. How exciting is oh. the thought of having oh. a, a lot of fans back there this year? It's exhilarating. Yeah. And uh, it, it, again, gives me more than hope. Um, a lot of thanks goes to Roger Penske, of course, mm -hmm. Mark Miles, Allison Langdon, Doug Bulls, the whole crew, every, everyone that's put a volunteer vest on that's going to make sure uh, the show goes on and, and on safely. Obviously, um, it's, you start there, safety first, and you look through the lens of being fan-centric. How will fans be able to enjoy this safely? And I'm, I'm just chomping at the bit. The, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, that race included, but the IMS means, and the month of May means so much to Hoosiers and who we are and where we've come from. It means, as you said, taking Indiana to the world everywhere I go, whether it's Budapest um, or, or Nagoya, it's that race comes up. And so it's of international importance to our state's future. There was a period of five years where we had five winners come from five different, not countries, continents. And so the reach of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway on an annual basis beyond the economic, you know, impact is enormous. It can't be overstated. And so for me to be thinking about fans who are, you know, hopefully vaccinated and, you know, wearing a mask and enjoying a, enjoying a race, nothing could be better for me. Yeah. We can't and wait. Joseph Newgarden is my. Oh, prediction. okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. He's my guy. Okay. Came in second in St. Pete. So I'm feeling good. <laughs> so as part of the $1.9 trillion. <laughs> With a T. Yeah. Trillion dollar American <laughs> rescue plan. Indiana will receive 3 billion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so as you think about and the state has you know, come up with a budget for the next year. How does this impact that? And what are the priorities? Well, it does. Uh, you know, there's a couple of ways to look at this, but positively, I'd say in one word, you say $3 billion, rightly so. That's, that's one round, by the way, um, of federal dollars that have come to help us weather this storm. But also local communities will be getting $2 billion on top of that. Uh, and so, yes, it gave us a lot of flexibility it, to address some one-time concerns. What we don't want to do is get into this um, situation where our programs that are working aren't sustainable. Mm -hmm. So we've been able to pull forward different projects and different efforts that we, quite frankly, just wouldn't have been able to do. And we think that'll end up generating revenue. So, you know, overall... Um, when you look at our, I, I just mentioned our economy was robust. We've already brought in, it's not, it's not the end of the week, but I know already where we are on a daily basis, we've already brought in 12,000 new job commitments this year. We're still in April, 12,000. We're, we're at about just over 1.9 billion in capital investment in the state of Indiana this quarter. We're at about, those jobs represent on average an hourly wage, $29.72 $29 an hour. Now, we're bringing in a lot more. Our pipeline is full. When you think about the sectors that are so important to the state of Indiana, obviously, the more people to get vaccinated, the more people travel, the more confidence, consumer confidence mm -hmm. is out there. That brings in our service sector even more so like we saw during March and through May. Um, and so I, I'm very bullish about our future, but we're wisely spending those dollars growing opportunity, um, not growing government. Um, and you know, for that, for that reason alone, we're, we're going to be doing things that we just wouldn't have been able to do, quite frankly. We're, we're going to build two new state park 
um, in lodges. Okay. The last, the last one we built was in 1939, Spring Mill, 1939. Our state park inns and lodges generate about three or four million on an annual basis to our revenue. Um, most states lose money in those. Mm -hmm. so, so we're making very smart investments where we know feed right into what um, is keeping our economy humming right now, RV industry, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we're watching growth rates, quite frankly, of our sectors. When you think about the RV sector, you know, they've doubled over the recent, the recent months and last year, doubled their growth. Now, will they double again in a year from now? We'll see, but I'd bet on them. Yeah, yeah, I would too. So you've got this 3 billion and you're, you know where some of it's going. Is yeah. there some you're not sure yet? And what does that process look yeah, like? Uh, somewhat. We we know that the you know where it will be directed. Maybe not the specific projects because we do want some flexibility. Because when you have this, you know, these federal dollars wash in, you don't know how long the recovery is going to be. So we're going to be smart about though. You know, there's. $550 million over here. There's $900 million over here. This goes for assets. This goes okay. for infrastructure. We haven't said this will go for X highway, mm -hmm. um, but we have said we're going to invest in our people. We're going to invest in our infrastructure, roads, rail, ports, air, and water, et cetera, uh, and, and making sure our economy continues to be more attractive than our surrounding neighbors and uh, one of the best in the, in the country. So it's all allocated, but not all specifically. Mm -hmm. But we okay. can, you know, with manufacturing readiness grants, one, one thing that we know that we have to do address our kind of to address our Achilles heel is make sure our manufacturing sector, number one in the nation per capita, our manufacturing, advanced manufacturing sector um, is retooling and modernizing their equipment. So we've got some programs to help with that. We'll run through that. And then I'll go right back to the budget committee and say, we need more to help us continue okay. to grow. So yeah. we have that flexibility. A lot of states don't have that. This is a real asset for us going through one of the toughest periods in our state's history to come out even stronger, making decisions that looked at the landscape as it truly is in this moment. And then thinking, where do we wanna be in 40 years? How do we become the best state for um, entrepreneurs yeah. in the country? Um, and, and, and all those decisions factored into this budget. I mean, it's, it sounds like you, um, the state didn't hunker down. They no, took advantage never, of, no. of, you know, what's available to be innovative and nimble and all that sort of thing. And it's yeah, yeah, the state never did hunker down. Now we did ask Hoosiers to be fair. And I took some criticism for this, R rightly so, because you can never get during a public emergency 100% to agree with you. But having said that, you know, if you rewind the tape a year plus ago, I asked Hoosiers to hunker down because we didn't have PPE inventory. We were, you know, we and the rest of the world were caught in this new situation and somewhat flat footed. So we had to, it, <laughs> Langham Logistics was so helpful, thank you, in making sure we were able to distribute uh, this new inventory. But you just think about when the book's written, whether it was ventilators or masks or hand sanitizer, how we went like this and like this and like this, and, like, and that roller coaster effect, always addressing the need at the moment. And the way that this virus ebbed and flowed itself by just its, its nature, we had to adapt quickly and change. And th that's why we remained nimble throughout it all. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Can you speak for a couple of minutes about the regional cities program oh. and all the success around that? Yes, and I'll try to just speak for a couple of minutes. I'm passionate about this. This is um, kind of round two of its predecessor, which was the regional cities initiative. That was $120 million um, that turned out to translate into $1.22 billion by the time the state put its $42 million into three different regions that generated in Evansville's example about 563 million. So really good money in attracted a lot more good money. And we're really able to transform regions, not just a, a block or a neighborhood, but transform a whole region by, by erasing lines, by thinking outside of just yourself, being part of something bigger than yourself. So we recognize that worked and we recognize that 
um, this could really be the X factor in terms of accelerating away from the pandemic for the state of Indiana um, to invest not just 120 or 150, but 500 million. So if you just do the math, you're thinking 500 million equals 5 billion if we perform like we did last time. But we know the more money put in yields more money at the other end of the uh, equation. So uh, what we're doing right now is going around the whole state of Indiana saying, put together your projects. We know that population scarcity, we know that talent recruitment and, and, um, and keeping talent here is of paramount importance to the future of our state. So it's not just facilities or buildings um, that improve your quality of place. It's your workforce development programs. It's your, how do you address the homeless issue, depending on where you are in the state of Indiana or hunger. Mm -hmm. It's all the things that maybe um, are your greatest asset or your greatest weaknesses. And, and just objectively addressing them, coming together, saying, and thinking like employees do and thinking like employers do both at the same time. Employers say, if I don't have access to talent to my workforce, I can't go there. So they think in terms of a radius, they think in terms of depending on the pay, the salary, you know, they can attract employees further and further away from that factory floor, so to speak, 30 miles, 45 miles, if it's worth the drive, the commute. And so we have to think that way regionally ourselves. And then you have to think in terms, you know, through the lens of the employee, where do I want to live? Where do I want to raise my family? Where do I want to grow my community and be part of something um, community? And, and um, so this, this brings both of those perspectives together into one and thanks in terms of, and by the way, we're allowing the regions to self-select. So it could be three counties. It could be 11 counties. Northeast Indiana had 11 counties the last time. Um, Evansville and South Bend, smaller regions, but a very powerful punch. Now we've got the forum up in Northwest Indiana. We've got one Southern Indiana that could be its own RDA and, and regions all in between, all stepping forward saying, I, I, I want to get my ticket. I don't want the train leaving the station this time because all of a sudden we can do projects that are going to have a uh, material and significant impact on, you know, how our state not only looks, but performs mm -hmm. four years, 40 years from now. Well, you're obviously extremely passionate about I this. Am. It has been very successful. Do you, do you feel like the regions and the cities have that same level of passion or do, do you see yeah, yeah. different levels around the uh, yeah. state of Indiana? Yeah, it's, um, I will say this. The first round really got people's attention. There okay. was somewhat of a parochial, you know, ah, I don't know if I want somebody else telling me what to do over there. They're, they're just fine um, or I'm just fine. But after the proof is in the pudding, you know, like after you see it work, yeah. after you see the business community, the philanthropic community, uh, the municipalities, towns, um, and the state all come together, there is something, uh, I won't say magical because it's by design, but there is something very special about um, lines being erased and thinking outside the box. And, and that's not just a partisan statement. It is, but it's also a city county statement. And so, again, if you're wanting to attract investment, you have to think bigger than just where you're standing and what you can see, whatever selfie you're about to take. You have to think broader than that and and that's what we've seen so i am i have received more interest on this program throughout the last four months during session okay. checking in i mean it's the appetite for this um, is enormous it's more than i can ever remember any other program and that is a really good thing we want this to be very competitive we want people to think big to think about what is shovel worthy not just shovel ready yeah. We want them to think bigger than shovel ready and, and whether projects are already in the works or you've just dreamt about them now is the time and Indiana is the place. Yeah. Well, we've worried for so long about these small towns in Indiana oh, yeah. and it just seems like they're dying while the large cities are yeah. continuing to grow. So this is, you know, this is a great opportunity for them to come together and, and find a way to be viable. Yeah. It's it great. just, it stitches everything together and, pulls people together and we know 
different strokes for different folks. You know, when we when we see the migration that's coming to the state of Indiana from outside of our borders, some prefer rural, some prefer suburban, some prefer urban. And we have to be able to use that to our advantage. We're blessed. When you think about the terrain, Indiana, and the municipalities like West Lafayette, Lafayette, the greater region, and you think about Columbus and Bloomington and Kokomo and it, Jeffersonville, it goes on and on and on. So it's not just the three biggest cities. We've got hubs everywhere. We have easy access to airports, regional and the best international airport in North America for the last nine years straight. And that's why you see companies of the um, Apple stature mm -hmm. going into places like Clayton, Indiana. Congratulations and, and a lot on of, that. Yeah, and a lot of people <laughs> probably couldn't have found Clayton on a map before yesterday. Now, maybe if you lived in Hendricks County or if you went to, you know, Pittsburgh Elementary, you knew or, or Plainfield. But, but now Clayton's not just on the map, but it is part of this growing high-tech ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. So economic development um, in general, you, you mentioned um, there's a lot going on and, and there's been a lot of success. I'm not sure how that compares to yeah. what you thought it would be a year ago, yeah. looking forward to this year. But you know, how are yeah. you feeling about that? And also, are there particular industries that we're focused on as a state? Oh, yeah. Yes, by design. Part of our, part of our plan or our um, mission statement. And, and that's kind of the tactical approach that we take is looking at our strong six, seven sectors, figuring out how to foster and cultivate um, those, those ecosystems, um, so to speak, to take us to that, to that next level. You know, last year, when I, when I just kind of reminisce or think back, who would have known th for 2020 we established the record for new job commitments. So over 31,000 during a global pandemic. When I was around my gubernatorial cohorts, I used to throw that <laughs> out there just to see if anybody would say, yes, yeah, so what, me too. But I never got that. What we heard when we were doing business, again, we adapted, we adjusted, and we were doing 2 a.m. phone calls, 3 a.m. phone calls, 4 a.m. phone calls. We were checking in saying, not just during the good times, but during the tough times, how you doing? What more could we be doing? That was not the norm during a very abnormal time. And, you know, you, uh, other CEOs, you're playing the long game. You're playing the forever game. And how do you grow or die? And so we were doing the same thing, making sure that going into a session after coming off such a strong year, knowing that folks were playing the long game, we said, now, how do we improve this, our tax and regulatory environment, et cetera, um, how we partner with um, these sectors, um, making sure that folks were modernizing, making sure that we're going after onshoring, addressing the supply chain, start to finish. I'll be doing part of a big announcement tomorrow in Southern Indiana and Princeton. Um, Can't give us a preview today. Uh, it's, it's another... <laughs> We're so appreciative for um, uh, our corporate partners is, yeah. is really what they are because, you know, you know this, I mean, it comes down to who supports the Little League in yeah. Gibson County, who supports the local schools, who's helping with those STEM yeah. programs. It is you, it is Eli Lilly, it is Cummins, it is Toyota, it is Subaru, it is Sweetwater, it is, and so again, you know, if our economy is growing, then we can do a whole lot more to make sure that we're refueling and growing the economy even more. Yeah. That's why, you know, I, I think in terms of how are we building up our people? How are we building up our infrastructure platform of which we all operate on and connect to one another and markets far flung? And how are we, how are we building up our economic attractiveness? every single day. And, and that's where our investments are going. Okay. All right. Great. Let's talk about um, social issues a bit. Homelessness is a big problem uh, yep. nationwide. Right. Um, Indiana is no exception to that. How are we thinking about, how are we solving that problem? With focus. Um, and, you know, this issue, a lot of folks 
seem to look at this again in a kind of a narrow with narrow vision thinking it's just a local issue it truly is a state issue it truly is an american issue especially with this kind of k-shaped recovery that we are all living through understanding that those with the least um, also have the least opportunity to rise back up and so we have to make a concerted effort we have to make investments um, because you look at kind of the tale of two cities you look at our our single family home building permits and they're off the charts. I mean, we're just crushing it around the state of Indiana. When you look at home sales, we're drawing people from not just inside our state, but from Cincinnati and Louisville and Chicago and down from Michigan. And they're moving all over the state of Indiana, quite frankly, those are good things. But how do we address community by community with the state's partnership? A couple of things. One, over the last five years, we've We've made enormous investments out of our housing authority, state housing authority, um, into the most um, in need of areas for those um, lower income family housing units, um, 20,000 some units over the last five years. And, and we've done some pilot projects, not, not just in any one area, Warsaw, Indiana. Um, here in Indianapolis and, and other places. So we'll continue to do more. We'll continue to make more investments into those projects. But one thing that came out of this session, and Lieutenant Governor Crouch is leading this effort. She oversees housing. Um, she's putting together an inventory of what is so that we truly know what's needed for builders, for realtors, for home buyers, for renters. You think about um, all the, again, uh, kudos to the federal government for helping us keep, you know, we helped about 136,000 families stay in a stable living environment okay. through throughout this when you look back and see uh, and, and review it. So understanding that we're punching our way through this and we're getting to the other side. Now, how do we address what's needed forever again, you know, long term? And um, so we'll continue to make investments out of our housing. But that that the inventory assessment that that study that Lieutenant Governor Crouch is doing will show us where the highest areas of need are and then where we need to point. Now, this is also something that anyone that's interested in pursuing that ready grant ought to be factoring in. So if hunger is your Achilles heel or homelessness is less is your you know Achilles heel, those need to be factored in. You, you have the opportunity to have the a world class um, um, hunger program or housing program locally. And it could be in Oaktown, Indiana, where my family comes from in Knox County, or it could be in the, um, the capital city of Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you work with the cities on that? Um, you know, I, I, I hear what you're doing at yep. a state level, yep. and it, is it a combined effort, sure. and is it aligned, or does yep. it feel like separate tracks? No, I think it gets more and more aligned, I think, if I was to okay. try to put this diplomatically. Depends on um, the, the level of interest as well, mm -hmm. um, but it's becoming such a, you can't just look the other way. If you, if you want to grow your way into an area where people want to move to stable housing yeah. is a building it's a cornerstone and so we're a very affordable state we got that going for us affordable cities affordable mm -hmm. towns we've got beautiful terrain um, but but we have to make sure that it, health is wealth and so if you're healthy if you have a stable home front so to speak um, that makes all the other things a little easier, not easy, but a little easier. And it makes it um, a whole lot harder. You end up chasing your tail. So to answer your question directly, we're, we're working hand in glove. We try to work harmoniously with our local partners. We see this, you know, a lot of this legislative session in my mind was seen through the lens of locals because that's where the rubber meets the road. That's, <laughs> you know, that's where you see these problems first expose right. themselves. And so we're trying to rush in there and, first and foremost, make sure that we occupy and keep the high ground as a state, but then now how do we reinvest at that, at that local level? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. 
Uh, we're really proud of the state's infant mortality. You know, the, just the change in that rate. And it, it was a long time coming and fantastic. Um, we, we made some, uh, some impact. So what factors yeah. led to that success? And is there anything we can learn from that and then apply to addiction or mental health yes. or the other you know, challenges? That's well framed. Um, you know, I don't want to, I'm going to single out three people just because it's hard to, because there's so many people who work with them, but Terry Stigdon at Child Services, Dr. Box, Department of Health, and Dr. Um, Jennifer Sullivan uh, at FSSA. I mean, yeah. these three are saints and these three are on the road all the time preaching that there is help out there. And that's why we set this goal. And it was a pretty mm -hmm. audacious goal. I remember saying it at a state of the state address and people went, ooh. I, literally, someone said as I was walking away from the podium, I don't know if I would have said that out loud. Like, good internal goal. But that was the point. Like, we want to be the best in the Midwest mm -hmm. by 2024. So <laughs> I, I gave it some time. Um, we're, on the, we're on our way. Yeah. It's going, you know, that rate has gone down three straight years. It's to the lowest in recorded history right now. So, and that goes back to about early 1900s. So we know the My Healthy Baby program is working. We know that OB Navigators is working. We know that being connected to mothers, not just for days, weeks, or a couple months, but over the long haul, a year, we know that our local partnerships this is what's key, mm -hmm. our local partnerships. We heat mapped this. We looked into the whole state of Indiana and said, we got to get to the worst first yeah. areas. And so we went into those targeted counties. We'll add another 23 or 25 counties over the course of this next year. And by 2023, we'll be in all 92 counties. So we've, we know that in the hardest hit communities, the numbers are coming down as well. Um, and we know what we're doing is working. We just need to do more of it. Mm -hmm. And again, that's somewhat in a good way, infectious. That good news is infectious. And it, and now we start getting word of mouth. But again, I mean, a lot, so much credit goes to Terry Stigden, Jen Sullivan, and, and Chris Box, because they have been relentless. Now, I haven't said that, and I'll be very quick about this. Those pilot programs are exactly what we're doing when it comes to mental health, uh, substance use disorder, mm -hmm. uh, addiction issues, um, uh, you know, bringing on all kinds of ways to speed up, get help qu quicker and closer so that we're like a SEAL team rushing in there and dealing with the problem right now so that we're not just way downstream going, how do we fix this? whether that's got to do with child services, foster children, you know, how, we're, we're, we're way upstream saying we're, we're going to go right at the, the root cause of the issue um, instead of just constantly focused on the symptom or the outcome. Yeah. Well, so same approach. Yeah. Well, you've got the A team there oh, and I'm sure any oh, of yeah. us would be more than willing to help. And I know. aim to keep them for another that's three and a right. half years. That's right. <laughs> so don't steal them. <laughs> <laughs> So how is, how is the state thinking about crucial conversations that need to be had hmm. about social issues uh, that are very divisive and we're at a point where no one wants to listen and yes. no one wants to talk about it, but we've got to somehow. Is there a plan for that? Again, such a great question. Um, couldn't agree with you more. And I think we're proving it. And I, I don't say that arrogantly, um, but, I, but I, I think the difference here in the state of Indiana is that, and I can give you some examples, but you have to have a plan. And that plan has to be public and reviewable and fact-based. A lot of people promote problems for gains other than solving the problem. Here in the state of Indiana, I can give you a couple of examples. One, Mike Smith stepped up to the plate and a whole teacher compensation commission. Mm -hmm. But for 
Mike's leadership and, and the whole commission, we wouldn't have been in a position to be allocating not just the 600 million, but $1.9 billion increase to education, one point, a little over a billion to public K through 12, making sure our teachers were making a minimum competitive wage. And we're able to do that partnering with local communities and school corporations. Um, but we wouldn't have done that without a plan. Yeah. That plan was referenced and cited and crunched and digested and used to arrive at that decision. I'll, I'll tell you another person, it could be a person of the year, um, is Representative Greg Sturwald. We, we came through a very difficult year, not just because of a virus, but because of riots and violence and outbursts. And we knew that we had to address some citizen and law enforcement relations. And, but for Greg Sturwald, Profile and Courage, he put together a plan that brought together some may have said strange bedfellows, mm -hmm. people of opposite parties, opposite professions, opposite places of life. Um, and, he, and he did the homework. He did the hard work first. And he was an honest broker. And we ended up doing things that I would hold up as a national model. And it was no drama. Hmm. And it was overwhelmingly supported. It gave me a lot of confidence in what we could do and, you know, I'm singling Greg Sturwald out because he led the charge, but he had a lot of other people. The Black Caucus came on board and said, let's get to work. We want to achieve something. So it really did uh, bring people together. And that's how I've tried to operate this administration. Low drama. Let's keep our eye on the ball. Um, come what may, pandemic, whatever. Um, but let's focus on what really matters and then let's solve this. Mm -hmm. And that requires a plan. And I just think in some areas, people, people have the, the daily talking points to try to score, right, exactly. but they're not trying to win. Fix and yeah. win, yeah. If, if they we'll won, then going. that issue would go away, you know, <laughs> yeah, and then what would you do? So I'm trying to help folks um, find the opportunity to transform their yeah. lives and their community and their family. And we're seeing that happen more and more and more. Yeah. Wow. Well, we're almost out of town, a time. I've got a couple more questions, so I'm going to try to Perfect. run through. But one is... Um, we'll see who drops off. And I know, right? <laughs> I can't not say something about the women's basketball oh, team yeah. at IU and how well they did in the tournament, getting back to basketball. Uh, that was pretty amazing. It's exciting. Yeah, yeah. Elite Eight. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and IU is... Um, Going through some change. And your alma mater. Yeah. yeah, yeah well, yeah, yes. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> new president, new yeah. basketball Excited. coach. Uh, yeah. Any comment on that? Uh, the best is still yet to come. And that's okay. that's exciting. I'm really um, I'm, I'm looking forward to not just Coach Woodson, you know, and, and um, President Witten. Uh, the, the good things to come. But I, I can remember watching the ladies at IU win the NIT just a couple of years ago, by the way, I think it was 2018, um, pretty darn exciting. But to yeah. think about their um, winning record over the last five or six years, I mean, they've been winning 20 games every year for a while now. And then to go to the lead eight, to lose to Arizona, a really good team, um, this bodes well for the future. Um, coach has got to be really proud. And then yeah. on the, yeah. on the men's side, um, look, I mean, sky's the limit he, obviously players want to play for him he can connect with um boosters like very few other oh, yeah. others um, you might say he's who's your royalty himself uh, he's going to command he's got a commanding presence and i'm looking forward to some really yeah. good college basketball special come come next year yes last question what is next for your political career <laughs> The easy one. Uh, well, I'll tell you, uh, you know, I like to quote different people. One is Yogi Berra, that great philosopher. And he said something like, you know, it's, it's tough making predictions, especially when it is about the future. Um, and, and I think, I think Yogi is right again, but, and, and I will also say this, I'm, I'm really interested in building roads into the future. But my roads are leading to Evansville and Jeffersonville and Anderson and Merrillville and Angola, literally Angola on May 4th. 
Um, and, and, you know, the, the next three and a half, four years won't be dictated in the least, never has in my life by some political office or any other office for that matter, because yeah. we got, we got too much time and too much potential to do good for me to look back and think something else would have guided me. Um, I want to, I want to look back on that road and that record of results in a proud way, not in a, why did I get distracted? Right. Wow. Well, thank you for everything you are doing for the state of Indiana. I, I think we all feel like you have our best interests at heart and, and you've proven it every step of the way. So thank you. I hope it shows. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah. I, well, and thank you. You're for the taking... ones, you're the engine that keeps it all going. <laughs> Thanks for taking some time with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to once again, thank our group of platinum sponsors. We really appreciate uh, your support of us. A recording of today's presentation will be available online at economicclubofindiana.com. Please join us next month for the season's finale on Wednesday, May 26, you may want to come to this yes. one to hear NBC sportscaster Mike Tirico. Oh. We will be in, uh, we'll be on site at the track. I think um, our friend Allison Melancton will be oh. helping us with that. Information for each of the season's presenters can be found at economicclubofindiana.com and have a wonderful afternoon.